tonight on CBC Vancouver News. There isn't anything we can do at this point in time. We can't pull physicians out of the air. Doctor shortage, emergency rooms shut down across BC amid severe staff shortages. Also. The injuries are significant, but the recovery process has started. Injured officers, a week after they were shot during a deadly bank robbery in Saanich, three officers remain in hospital. And... Why did they attempt to suspend me? Because I told the truth. Suspension lifted, and Battle Chief Roseanne Archibald survives a key vote to keep her job. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, I'm Leanne Young. Thanks for joining us. Doctors across our province are warning of looming emergency room closures because of severe staff shortages. CBC News has learned the ER in Port Alberni could be the next to face consistent closures throughout the summer. Michelle Gassoub has been tracking this story for us and she joins us now in studio. So Michelle, tell us more. What's happening in Port Alberni? Leanne, the emergency room at Port Alberni's West Coast General Hospital could be closed for much of August and September because there aren't enough doctors. A healthcare worker at the hospital alerted us to this on the condition we keep them anonymous. Now, this is an emergency room that sees 60 to 80 visits a day and serves a population of over 18,000 people. If it closes, patients needing emergency care would have to travel to Nanaimo or to Fino. That's more than an hour or even two hours away. And it's a especially concerning in August when many tourists will be visiting the island. Right, that is indeed concerning, Michelle, but this also isn't the first ER closure we've had in BC in recent months. Where else has this been happening? Well, we've already seen temporary closures in Clearwater, Chetwind and Port McNeil. And just yesterday, Merritt had to close its emergency room with very little notice after a doctor called in sick. It didn't reopen until 8 a.m. today. Now, Interior Health redirected patients to Kamloops and Kelowna. Again, an hour or an hour and a half away, the mayor of Merritt says it's not up to them to deal with this type of staffing challenge. We're not in a position to be able to attract uh, nurses and doctors at this point in time, we rely on our overall healthcare system to provide them for us. It's not the city of Merritt's responsibility to um, fill healthcare positions. So we really have to rely on Interior Health to do that for us. Okay, Michelle, so as the mayor says, it's not, not up to the municipality. So what are health authorities and the province doing to help prevent these closures? Well, they're trying to avert closures. I've gone back and forth with Island Health. They maintain there are no planned closures for August or September. They say they're working to mitigate the situation and a closure would really be a last resort measure. We also asked Health Minister Adrian Dix about ER closures. We're going to continue to do what we've been doing, which is um, hiring and building resources out in our healthcare system because we're asking our healthcare system to do more and the healthcare system is responding. As you heard there, the minister would not comment directly on the situation in Port Alberni and whether that community will have an emergency room later this summer, but we'll continue to track the story. Leanne? All right, thanks, Michelle, for bringing that to us. Michelle Gassoub with us this evening. Three officers injured during an armed robbery at a bank in Saanich are still in hospital a week after the shooting. The bank robbery in Saanich left two suspects dead. Two of the wounded officers in hospital are from the Saanich Police Department. One is in stable condition and the other is in ICU. They've undergone three surgeries, but the police chief says they're showing signs of improvement day by day. Another wounded Saanich officer is at home recovering. Injuries are significant, but the recovery process has started. It is not over by any means. It's going to be a very long road. Chief Duffy described last week's deadly robbery as very difficult to put into words. He says he did not release the identities of the injured officers to protect their privacy and their well-being. It took a moment for me to really have a, a deep thought and, and make some strong considerations of the potential impacts for this. And from that, I, again, didn't want to uh, risk any type of uh, situation that would take away from their healing process. 
The Victoria Police Department says it echoes the sentiment on privacy. One of their officers remains in hospital and two are recovering at home. The robbery suspects were identified as 22-year-old twin brothers Matthew and Isaac Octolani from Duncan. It's not clear who shot first between the suspects and police. Police have described the efforts of the injured officers as heroic. The trial of a Dutch man accused of sexually extorting BC teen Amanda Todd continues this week in New Westminster. The jury is hearing testimony from several police officers who first investigated the online harassment. Our Eva Yuguen Senj is following the trial. This week, the criminal trial of Aiden Coban has focused on the 2011 police investigation into his alleged online harassment of 14-year-old Amanda Todd. That year, the Ridge Meadows RCMP first began hearing from the Todd family. Constable Matthew Condon testified today he was dispatched to Todd's father's house in November. Norman Todd told him his daughter had moved to Maple Ridge from Coquitlam to escape the relentless stream of online messages she had been receiving. A former classmate of Amanda Todd also testified. He was 13 years old when he called the police to report pornographic images of Todd being posted on Facebook in 2011. On Monday, the court heard from two former officers in the RCMP's sex crimes unit. Those female officers met with Amanda Todd and her parents several times. Both officers testified how the teenager signed into her Facebook account to show police the messages coming from a profile with the name Tyler Boo, the person behind it claiming to possess nude videos of Todd and threatening to send them to her friends and family unless she sent more videos. The officers said they tried to convince Todd to delete her social media accounts, but she would not. Todd died by suicide in 2012 at the age of 15. She had been exploited online for three years. The Crown alleges Coban used 22 fake online accounts to repeatedly harass and extort the teenager to share explicit images and video of herself. He faces five charges, including extortion, child pornography, and child luring. Coban has pleaded not guilty to all counts. The trial is expected to last another three weeks. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. BC's largest public sector union is preparing to take job action. Talks have collapsed between the union and the BC government. BC's, gover BC's General Employees Union was not able to come to an agreement with the government's public service agency. The key issue demands over a cost of living protection to address skyrocketing inflation. The BC GEU represents 33,000 members, including social workers, corrections officers and liquor distribution branch workers. And just as British Columbians brace for an all-out public service strike, the Truckers Association says its members have voted unanimously in favour of job action. It's a real thing that we are not willing to go on a strike. But the problem is no one is, is willing to listen to us. So that's why we have to take a hard, hard step. At issue, a program aimed at banning trucks 12 years and older from the port beginning in September. The truckers say the scheme will impose crippling costs on drivers, while the port says the program is aimed at improving air quality. There is a significant amount of support for the program across the trucking industry, and even the British Columbia Trucking Association is very supportive of the actions that we're taking, and certainly all of the communities in and around the port, which is the main reason for us taking this kind of action. The port says 80% of its total fleet is already compliant within the upcoming limits. The truckers say the two sides plan to hold talks later this month. Home sales continue to drop in Greater Vancouver, with last month's numbers trending down about 35% compared to last June. Sales also dipped more than 23% below the 10-year average for the June. The board says rising interest rates and concerns about inflation are making buyers more cautious. Home prices also slid just a bit, down 2% in June from May's prices. The benchmark price for all residential properties in Greater Vancouver still sits just above $1.2 million. Well, the sun is out, but it still might not be the best idea to head to the beach. A number of popular beaches across Metro Vancouver are contaminated with the bacteria E. coli. Trout Lake, Deep Cove and Sandy Beach and Snug Cove on Bowen Island all have high concentrations of E. coli. In Deep Cove, tests have found the levels are more than 46 times the safe limit. 
Now Vancouver Coastal Health is warning people to stay out of those waters and those shores. E. coli can cause gastrointestinal and upper respiratory illnesses, as well as skin, eye or ear infections. All right, Joe, those sounded like some uh, pretty unpleasant things, but the weather mm -hmm. seems to have made a, a bit of a pleasant turnaround. Yes, you're right. Uh, for Metro Vancouver, Leanne, it has been a gorgeous day, almost seasonal, lots of sunshine. It's just a brief break, though. We do have a few more showers to get through. And I do want to talk about a very different story in the interior, a state of emergency, a local state of emergency issued for Penticton because of flash flooding yesterday. I want to take you to the uh, director of uh, emergency uh, services about the localized situation that led to the flooding. Take a listen. Within a half an hour period, uh, 45 minute period, there was 12 to 14 uh, millimeters of rain that fell uh, in the community. So a uh, very intense storm in a very short period of time and uh, uh, the systems weren't able to cope during that period of time and our emergency team was able to respond uh, as quickly as we could. They received 86 calls reporting flood damage. That state of emergency declared to allow emergency crews to enter private properties. But you can see here, how quickly, as you mentioned, the system overwhelmed by the deluge from an isolated thunderstorm cell that did also lead uh, to thunder, lightning, and small size hail. Uh, about 16 people evacuated from their homes, four to six families. And I've actually set the satellite and radar back. You can see that thunderstorm line that moved through yesterday afternoon. It's been clear today and crews uh, are continuing to respond and assess to the damages from that flooding. But this is the kind of setup we were worried about yesterday, these moisture laden storms, and we'll be worried about again tomorrow. And in fact, we have a new system sliding in from the south, uh, just about to bring heavy rain to Port Renfrew on the island. That's the system that will bring showers to Metro Vancouver overnight tonight for a showery start to our Wednesday. But as the system slides north into Thursday, it's Thursday that we're worried about, again, that kind of isolated downpour setup and flash flooding. Uh, through the southern sections of the province. And you can see what a contrast we have as far as disasters that we're watching. This is the fire danger rating for today in the southern half, very low. It's flooding that we're worried about. The uh, waterways are already so swollen because of that snow melt. Doesn't take much in the north. And uh, Leanne, you can see that we're already uh, at extreme uh, because of how little rain. So I'll keep you posted on both those situations and have more summer weather to talk about coming up. Okay, that sounds good, Joe. You know, there's always that trade-off, right? When we want a lot of sunshine, there's that wildfire danger. And nice Double to see at sword, least. For sure. Yeah, for sure. All right, thanks, Joe. You're welcome. A crucial decision for the Assembly of First Nations and the fate of its leader as she fights allegations and to keep her job. That's next. And thank you for watching our commercial-free live stream. As you may have noticed, interest in the great outdoors has surged in recent months. COVID lockdowns had many Canadians seeking out wide open spaces. That brought a boom for recreational vehicle sales. But as Aaron Collins explains, some worry that sky-high interest rates and gas prices may mean the RV bubble could soon burst. It's a sure sign that summer has arrived. RV owners getting ready to hit the open road. This home on wheels has been to pretty much every corner of Canada. We figured that we've got about 400 square feet in here. But high gas prices will keep trips in this rolling condo closer to home this summer. This year they're quite scaled back and um, mainly because of the cost. We're thinking twice about taking trips. It's not stopping us but we're definitely thinking twice about what we're going to do. Well, that could signal a shift from recent years when a record number of RVs hit the road. 600,000 motorhomes and trailers were built in North America last year alone. What we've seen over the past couple years is that the pandemic has supercharged that, that long-term growth. It's been busy at this RV lot just outside Calgary throughout the pandemic. Everything from vans to luxury motorhomes have been hard to keep in stock. This one's got the Televator TV there that's uh, with the fireplace oh, entertainment. I love it. But sales have begun to slow a bit this year. Some buyers reacting to higher gas prices. Still shopping, but looking for a smaller, cheaper RV. People are being a little bit more fuel conscious 
And I think the industry has been going that way for a long time with lighter materials and a little bit of stuff that's easier to tow. And it's not just fuel prices that could have new RV buyers thinking twice down the road, creating worries about an RV bubble ready to burst. Rising inflation, rising gas prices, rising borrowing costs, so all of these factors will be things that cons consumers will take into consideration. And with so many RVs now on the road, if demand were to collapse, it could mean a bumpy ride for anyone looking to ditch their RV for good. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Now to the turmoil within the Assembly of First Nations and new developments tonight as National Chief Roseanne Archibald fights to keep her job. She survived the first of three key votes on her leadership at the AFN's annual meeting here in Vancouver. As Olivia Stefanovic explains, it follows a day of high drama. A women's warrior song as the National Chief prepared for the fight of her political life. They want to silence they want me to stop talking about the truth, that there is corruption in the AFN. Roseanne Archibald and her supporters say the driving forces behind attempts to remove her are misconduct and misogyny in the Assembly. We tried to call it out. It was never, never addressed. And here we are today standing behind AFN National Chief Archibald. <laughs> The executive committee that suspended her says Archibald interfered in workplace complaints filed against her by four of her own staff members, three of whom are women. If the AFN is to continue as a useful organization, the national chief has been making this impossible. It says Archibald's decision to reveal confidential information about that external investigation, along with her allegations of corruption within the AFN, put it in legal peril. These regional chiefs have overstepped their authority. Archibald supporters tried to dissuade chiefs from voting for resolutions to oust her or maintain her suspension. Forensic I'm sorry, audit I have and to fully ask determine to the, the extent of our off. financial improprieties. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Archibald spent her speech eviscerating the organization. There have been decades of calls for reform. Decades. And that has been met with resistance and, in my case, retaliation. Please raise your lanyard. Making her case for a new type of organization before a vote in her favor with calls to keep her suspension in place voted down. I need my phone back. I need my emails back. I need to be reinstated fully. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, as we know, COVID-19 is already disrupting plans for parents and kids. And as Allison Northcott shows us, outbreaks have already turned some summer camps into ghost towns. What was supposed to be a bustling summer camp this week is all but empty. The campers sent home amid an outbreak of COVID-19, mostly among staff. When we're losing staff, that's the issue, right? So we quickly start going to a position where uh, we don't have as comfortable of a ratio. 
It's one of at least three Quebec camps closed temporarily because of COVID. Another camp in Huntsville, Ontario, has also cancelled session because staff have tested positive. And launch your boat! This Yellowknife Day camp scrambled to find replacements when a counselor tested positive days before camp started. Which was a setback to say the least because of such a, a, a tight turnaround. And we do try to have backup plans, but quite honestly, um, because of the staffing shortage, we just, we roll with it at this point and, um, and try to make it happen. For many camps, this is the first summer back without mandatory COVID restrictions since the pandemic began. And I so want for my camp, my campers to have as much of a normal summer as possible, but definitely every morning sort of hold my breath as another person reports to the health center with some form of COVID symptoms that you have to test and just pray for the end of the 15 minutes that it will be negative, you know, so it's, it's an unsettling time. For some parents, it's upended summer plans. This family drove 11 hours from Maryland to pick up their daughter, but say they understand. So we were getting ready for barbecues and, uh, oh, and, yeah. and friends over and okay. everything. So we had to hit the road, but again, you know, it, it's, it's, okay. It is what it is with this time period, Perfect. you know. Quebec's health ministry has recommendations for COVID protocols for summer camps, but says the decision to close a camp or not when there are cases is up to each establishment. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The City of Toronto is ordering some contractors to rehire and accommodate six security guards. They had lost their jobs over a rule requiring them to be clean-shaven to wear N95 masks. As Dale Manukaduk reports, this comes after the World Sick Organization of Canada filed a complaint against the city. For me, if you ask me to clean-shave my beard, it's like peeling off my skin kind of thing. Birko Walsing Anand says he was recently laid off by ASP security. Last month, the City of Toronto issued a directive around the use of N95 masks in its shelter system. There are people in our shelter system who uh, may have underlying medical conditions, and so we have an obligation to protect them, but also to protect our workers, uh, or in this case, contractors. Anyone working in close proximity to vulnerable persons in congregate settings has to wear an N95. The policy says that staff, including contractors, must be clean-shaven to fit properly into the mask and ensure its effectiveness. Anand was informed by his employer about the directive. Ultimately, they said that uh, this is something which is not coming from them. Uh, this is something coming from the City of Toronto, and you need to follow that. If not, then you will be laid off. So within two, three days, I was laid off. The City of Toronto says it abides by all human rights legislation and all contractors must also abide by the city's human rights and anti-harassment discrimination policy. The World Sick Organization says the city is just passing the buck. And when these contractors get the accommodation request, they just say, well, we don't have any other work, so we're laying you off. Uh, sorry, out of luck. This is the worst uh, response I've, I've seen from the City of Toronto. But the city issued a news release after CBC inquired about the layoffs, stating the city itself has granted seven accommodation requests to its own employees who have sought religious exemptions in shelter settings and fully expects such accommodations, if requested by contract employees, to also be granted by contractors to those employees. It goes on to say it's directed contractors to reinstate all employees and will be looking at its legal options up to and including terminating the contracts of any contractors found to be in violation of city policy or human rights legislation. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. A new survey of health care workers by the Canadian Union of Public Employees points to an alarming amount of physical and sexual violence experienced on the job. Lorenda Redikoff spoke with one worker who recounted multiple incidents of violence at his workplace. Dave Virch worked for 33 years as a registered practical nurse in Ottawa at this continuing care facility for seniors and others with chronic illness. Violence definitely is part of the job, unfortunately. Um, I've been punched, I've been kicked, I've been scratched. Um, I've had things thrown at me. Unfortunately, sometimes it was urine or, or worse. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it happens in the workplace. Now he works with his union, the Ontario Council of Hospital Workers, part of QP. Every day, Hundreds of healthcare workers are hit, sexually assaulted, racially attacked, and verbally harassed in Ontario hospitals. 
The union represents 50,000 hospital staff, including RPNs, cleaners and clerical workers, mostly women. Of the 2,300 members surveyed, 63% said they experienced physical violence from patients or family members. 14% said daily. 78% said they experienced non-physical violence, such as name-calling, insults, threats or threatening gestures. 25% said daily. Plus, 49% said they experienced experienced sexual harassment. 36% said they experienced sexual assault, such as groping or inappropriate touching. Virch believes women have it worse than he did. I'm a big guy. I think maybe uh, patients or families think twice about, you know, uh, uh, slurring a, a comment or a physical assault, but I think there's less restraint when it comes to a female co-worker. Of the respondents who identify as racialized, 71% say the abuse or harassment they receive is connected to their race or ethnicity. We are here to demand that the management of these hospitals, the Premier and the new Health Minister not look the other way. And that was Lorenda Redekop reporting from Ottawa. The gunman suspected of killing seven people at a parade in a Chicago suburb yesterday is now facing seven first-degree murder charges. Police say they believe the suspect had planned the attack for weeks. And as Nick Harper reports, the gunman went disguised as a woman. Scenes of fear and chaos as a 4th of July parade turned into America's latest mass shooting. People fled for their lives as a gunman fired from a rooftop down into the crowd. 21-year-old Robert Cremo III was arrested shortly after the attack in Highland Park, a suburb of Chicago. Authorities say he'd planned the shooting for weeks and carried out the attack in disguise. Cremo was dressed in woman's clothing, and investigators do believe he did this to conceal his facial tattoos and his identity and help him during the escape. Following the attack, Cremo exited the roof, he dropped his rifle, and he blended in with the crowd, and he escaped. Authorities say DNA recovered from the rifle, which was bought legally, played a vital role in identifying Cremo. He allegedly fired more than 70 rounds into the crowd. 30 people were treated in local hospitals. One doctor compared the wounds to wartime injuries. Many in the community are still in shock that their parade could become a scene of tragedy. Today is a day of grieving together, a day to pause, a day to remember those who left us, those who were injured. State Senator Julie Morrison was at the parade when the shooting began. Moms and dads carrying their kids, kind of weaving in and out of the cars, doing whatever they could to get away from that intersection, running down side streets. My son took his family and ran down a side street. I don't think he even knew where he was, but he wanted to get off the main street. You just can't prepare for it. You just can't. Police say they still don't know the motive for the attack, but according to the non-profit organization Gun Violence Archive, it marks America's 309th mass shooting of the year. Nick Harper for CBC News, Washington. Russia's war on Ukraine has led to a historic moment at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Finland and Sweden are a step closer to joining NATO. As Ashley Burke reports, the two Nordic countries signed off on the protocols today. The conflict in Ukraine isn't letting up, and now this move could further isolate Russia. Finland and Sweden joining the Defence Alliance would be its most significant expansion since the 1990s, dramatically extending NATO's border to Russia by more than 1,300 kilometres in Finland. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg called this a truly historic moment. With 32 nations around the table, we will be even stronger, and our people will be even safer as we face the biggest security crisis in decades. Together we are stronger in defending the rules-based international order and the principles of democracy, freedom and rule of law. As a future member of the alliance, Sweden will contribute to the security of all allies. We are convinced that our membership will strengthen NATO and add to the stability in the Euro-Atlantic area. 
The Finnish and Swedish governments formally applied for membership to NATO in May, and that set off an intense diplomatic process. The biggest hurdle so far, Turkey. That country had agreed last week to lift its potential veto of the Nordic country's membership bids, but yesterday Turkey's foreign minister renewed that threat and said that they won't ratify the deal unless Finland and Sweden fulfill their promises to do more to combat terrorism and extradite suspects. Now, if allies' parliaments do ratify this deal, the process could take up to a year. Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, issued his own warning last week, saying if NATO set up military infrastructure in Finland or Sweden, he would respond. Ashley Burke, CBC News, London. Meanwhile, in Britain, Prime Minister Boris Johnson was dealt another big blow today. Two senior members of his cabinet and inner circle have resigned. Health Secretary Sajid Javid and Finance Minister Rishi Sunak are leaving. Both say they no longer have confidence in Johnson's leadership. It comes after a series of scandals. The most recent saw Johnson apologize over the handling of sexual misconduct claims against a former colleague. Johnson recently survived a non-confidence vote, but about 40 percent of his Conservative caucus voted to oust him as leader. Ocean life isn't limited to the water. It's above the waves, too, in the air. After the break, we get back to our series on coastlines and the wide-ranging world of seabirds. Stay with us. Michael J. Fox is having the kind of summer most actors only dream about. His first major motion picture, Back to the Future, is doing tremendous business at the box office. Now I need your help to get back to the year 1985. Here in 1985, the TV sitcom that launched Fox's career is also a smash hit. Family Ties is fourth in the ratings, and Fox makes the kind of money Alex Keaton, the arch-conservative character he plays, lusts after. Stay calm. Alex, why don't you stay calm? Okay, fair enough. That's a start. <laughs> With the success of Back to the Future, movie producers have big plans for Fox's movie career, but he's still interested in his TV series. It seems like everybody's uh, kind of planning this, this film thing for me, and I'm going, wait a minute, you know, Alex is waiting. i got to get back, for, back and be Alex for another... Uh, another year and then and then I'll do something next summer and hopefully I'll keep doing family ties until they fire me. Yeah. He hasn't had to worry about a job since he was 15. His first role was in the CBC Vancouver production Leo and Me. I added it up on the way home Leo. I've been in seven jams. A little shorter and the hair a little longer but even then he was getting roles because he looked younger than his age. I will not race mice in school 1,000 times. Teachers told him he was wasting his time, but Fox decided early on he was going to be an actor. Maybe I am going to turn out bad. His family must have wondered how he'd turn out when he dropped out of high school to take that role, or when he moved to Hollywood when he was just 18. But now when he's home in Burnaby visiting, there's no doubt he made the right choice. These pictures were taken two years ago, before the big jump to stardom. But then as now, he says trips home from Los Angeles helped keep his feet on the ground. They're not going to let me get away with, um, you know, being being a, a a jerk or 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 letting what I do create a distance that shouldn't be there. In the backyard in Burnaby, he's just Mike Fox, not the media star Michael J. Fox most people have come to know. Yeah, it's really funny. You know, little kids uh, don't. You know, never say Michael Fox or whatever. It's Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. Or they'll say, "Excuse me, are you Mr. J. Fox?" So it's funny because it keeps it. Also, that name keeps a little bit of distance between that and, and Mike Fox. You know, from Burnaby, Michael J. Fox. It's a different person. He obviously enjoys all the public attention and the pampered treatment of a star. To John, to John J O N. But it is still work, and whether it's signing an autograph or dashing off to your next interview it's all part of selling michael j fox and the movie michael j fox is this year's teen idol sweet success for the 24 year old star and a tribute to mike fox the kid from burnaby isn't he a dreamboat for the journal i'm jerry mcintosh in new york
Well, marine life isn't limited to what's under the water. In this latest installment of our series on coastlines, we look to the skies, specifically to seabirds and their reliance on the ocean and the impact on the ecosystem. When we think about ocean wildlife, our minds might go to fish, whales, sharks, generally animals that live underneath the water. But some of the most important biodiversity lives above the ocean's surface. I'm Connell Bradwell, a wildlife conservationist here in British Columbia. And I'm Erica Porter, a fisher here in Nova Scotia. We are the hosts for Coastlines, a CBC series that brings together young Canadians who are working to save our animals, plants and habitats on all three of Canada's coasts. And today we're talking about seabirds. Seabirds are both marine and terrestrial animals, meaning they rely on both the land and the sea for their survival. Now, they spend most of their lives out at sea, but will return to land to breed, often in huge colonies. Many of these birds embark on epic journeys out at sea, crossing multiple countries and thousands of kilometers. Just one bird's life, it's going farther than any of us will probably go in our lifetime, so that's just really impressive for such a small bird. Joanna Wong and her team recently helped to map the Canadian Arctic Tern migration for the first time. Arctic Terns are the world's uh, longest migrating animal and they're about just the size of an apple. They're relatively small, but they travel huge distances. In fact, every year they migrate from the Canadian Arctic all the way down to the Antarctic, covering up to about 90,000 kilometers round trip. You heard that right. The Arctic Terns will migrate from pole to pole in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. But for a long time, exactly what route these terns were taking on their long polar journey was a mystery. So scientists on Joanna's team traveled to the Arctic terns breeding sites, attaching these tiny, tiny computers onto the bird's ankle using a small ring. We have this little computer, as you can see here. It's very minuscule. And the reason it's so tiny is because I mentioned these arctic terns are very small birds. So you need a device that's small enough that it doesn't drag them down in their flight. As part of Joanna's research, she analyzed all of the data collected by these computers and mapped out routes that the arctic terns take from the Canadian Arctic to the Antarctic and back. They found that all the arctic terns, whether they breed in Canada, Europe or elsewhere, are taking the same migrating route to the Antarctic, likely because of food availability and using the wind currents to their advantage. Knowing where arctic terns are migrating and at what times can help us to protect them along particularly important segments of their long migration. The more science we gather about arctic terns, the better equipped decision makers will be to strategically protect the lands and the waters that are important to marine birds. One of these important places is Newfoundland, the seabird capital of North America, which is home to a globally significant number of wintering and breeding seabirds, like the ever charismatic Atlantic puffin. Karen Richards, a researcher out of Memorial University, has spent her fair share of time with these very cute birds. My PhD is investigating the impact of extreme weather events on two threatened seabirds, the Atlantic puffin and the leech's storm petrel. Both of these species nest in burrows on islands during the breeding season. Now, Newfoundland isn't necessarily known for its balmy weather. And with climate change bringing more extreme temperatures and storms to the island, the chicks are left particularly vulnerable to extreme conditions. Karen's trying to better understand how to save these threatened chicks. We placed temperature loggers in these burrows to see how exposed these chicks were to extreme weather events during 2021. 2021 proved to have its fair share of extreme weather for Newfoundland, including Hurricane Larry, which clocked wind speeds of 180 kilometers an hour. But despite this, apparently the chicks didn't do too badly. We found that these burrows were providing amazing protection for the chicks. The burrows were around 10 degrees warmer during extreme cold events and also 10 degrees cooler during extreme warm events. Burrows used by the puffins and storm petrels that Karen researches is a fairly common form of nesting for seabirds. But here on the west coast, Sonia researches a species called marble merlet. They take an entirely different approach to nesting. They're quite solitary and they utilize old growth forests. They nest in the high canopies of the old growth rainforest, choosing mossy platforms to lay their little green eggs. Because their terrestrial environment is declining, 
and generally their population trends are going down. In Canada, they're listed as threatened. You can't just study them in half their habitat. You also have to study them in their marine habitat. And that's basically what I do. Sonia is painting a more complete picture of the pressures and conservation opportunities for these birds. They, they're facing pressures on, on two sides. On the one side, the amount of old growth available is decreasing. And then on the other side, the marine habitats are becoming busier places. And on top of that, the waters are warming, which decreases the amount of food available in certain areas in certain years. This means that marbled merlets are faced with less choices for nesting habitat on land. But even if they do find a viable nesting site, if the marine environment nearby doesn't have enough food for them, I mean, they still won't be able to nest there anyways. Seabirds are a great example of how our lands and oceans are uniquely connected. Because of their life cycles, they're on the front lines of the climate crisis. They're resilient, but more science and action is needed so we don't lose these remarkable birds. Extreme weather events taking hold around the world, from fires to floods. What's driving that destruction? That story's next. And it is 6.39 p.m. There's your live shot at Cots Bay in Tofino from Pacific Sands Beach Resort on a gorgeous, gorgeous night. I wish I was those two people on the beach hanging out right now. Not so bad. Johanna will be back with the forecast. And if you can expect more of that gorgeous sunshine, that's coming up. Every, every step was followed, right? This spring, Andreas Mann discovered his beautifully stained deck was not so beautiful anymore. In the summer of 2020, he painstakingly prepared the wood and applied two coats of a stain that came with a four-year guarantee. It's just coming off. This is the deck now. Mann complained to the company, and they offered some compensation with a catch. They wanted me to sign a waiver that I will release them from everything, but I have to sign it in order to get reimbursed. And I said, of course, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I reached out to PPG, the company that makes the stain that man used. They said the stain is satisfaction guaranteed for four years on decks, but it has to be applied and maintained according to the directions on the label. Those instructions say that when you're applying it, you should do it when no rain is expected for eight hours, when the temperature is at least two degrees Celsius and will stay above that for 24 hours. You should also avoid staining in direct sunlight or on hot surfaces, and you should apply just one thin coat. But expert painters say there is more to consider. So here as we pull it up, you can see it's bringing up the old stain. Our winters, our, our weather, um, we ha seem to get a lot of moisture in the spring, which, which doesn't help with the wood. Ebert says prep work is the most important part of the process. First, he tests the wood's moisture. It should be between 12 and 15 percent. After scraping and removing debris, he sands the wood. So. When sanding it, I like to go with a coarser sanding paper at the beginning, maybe a 60 or an 80, and then before you're actually going to be doing the staining, finish it off with a 120 grit, uh, something finer. When staining, it should be between 15 and 24 degrees, with no rain or frost in the forecast for a few days. And if you want the stain to last... I also do recommend, and this might sound a little bit weird but in the prior to winter time if you tarp your deck it gives it a much longer longevity versus if you don't tarp it and the snow and the ice and melting follow all these steps and ebert says a deck should last three to four years man isn't sure what he'll do next he's considering hiring someone to restain the deck or switch to composite madeline cummings cbc news edmonton
Wildfires have burned more than a thousand hectares of forest in the Valencia region of southeastern Spain. Firefighters managed to bring the fire under control earlier this week, but a change in the wind caused it to flare up again. The military has sent reinforcements to the scene. There are more than 200 people battling the flames, which are threatening a nature preserve. Storms and strong winds are forecast to continue in the area. And heading further south of the hemisphere, eastern Australia rings a familiar sight to BC flood victims last November. That region is hit with repeated flooding as they come off a record wildfire season. Sasha Petrasik shows us the hardship it's causing and how extreme weather incidents around the world may all be connected. With ranches underwater and 50,000 in Sydney suburbs facing evacuation, the rain just won't seem to leave eastern Australia alone. Again, it's the speed that it's coming up um, very quickly. Uh, yesterday we had rises of one and a half metres every hour at one stage. Some areas have been drenched with a year's worth of water in three days, pushing Gay Peters out of her home for the fourth time in several months. Absolutely devastated. It's really hard. Volunteer help has been stretched to the limit. The community is still recovering from the last flood and the one before. Actually, some people are still recovering from the fires. Um, I, you know, we're just all in shock and everybody is traumatised. Australia has faced flood after flood interspersed with record heat waves and forest fires. And it's not alone. Just in the past weeks, extreme weather has left Europe and parts of Asia dry and scorching setting off wildfires in Spain, melting, collapsing a glacier in Italy's Dolomite Mountains, killing at least seven climbers. A typhoon and heavy rains pelted southern China during the weekend, forcing rescuers to pull sailors from a sinking ship, leaving many communities flooded. Experts say there's one factor linking all of these more frequent weather emergencies. We don't need to do attribution studies on every single one of them because we know already that climate change is uh, a key driver here. Australia's extreme weather isn't about to end soon. With dams overflowing and rivers still surging, experts say this flood will be followed by more. Sasha Petrusik, CBC News. Toronto. Wow, Joe, those scenes there out of Australia and around the world, many of them very familiar to us here on the West yeah. Coast. And really connected by La Nina. Uh, we're dealing with that, leading to our cool and soggy weather. And especially in Australia, one of the signatures of a La Nina year is that flooding. But as we know, climate change enhancing uh, all of these, as uh, Sasha mentioned. I want to take us to our current temperatures because we've been cooler than normal for a few days now. Uh, 20 right now in Webby are just sneaking into that 20 degree mark in the last hour. So 24 out towards Abbotsford, a nice recovery from yesterday. Seeing those 23s across the strait and through Nanaimo, uh, 23 up towards Squamish as well. So getting close to our seasonal, which for Vancouver, uh, based on the last 30 year average anyway, about 21 as our afternoon high. This is what's moving in quickly from the south though. We've been dealing with this low pressure system spinning in our atmosphere for a few days now and we're starting to see some isolated downpours track through seattle coming up through bellingham and this is what will cross into the south coast and also across to the southern interior and uh, we do have a three-year-old very excited about potential for rain here uh, i want to take you back to that fire danger map where we do have again the concern for uh, localized flash flooding uh, we have an update from environment Canada just sent to uh, a, as a bit of a heads up, not a warning or a watch or a special weather statement, just keeping an eye on the situation for Thursday as far as the flood situation flood situation goes. Watch as I time this out for you. Uh, tomorrow, generally fairly dry, but as we head into the afternoon, here's pausing this at 3 p.m. You can see uh, pop-up showers, especially Prince George and Northward. But as we head into Thursday, 
that risk really amplified down towards the caribou and the kootenai. So this is what we're concerned about the next couple of days, just like what we saw in Penticton, the possibility for some flash flooding in the next couple of days with this latest moisture laden system coming in from the south. We will see sunshine tomorrow though, 22 and through Williams Lake, 26 and through Cranbrook, and uh, hoping for some sunshine tomorrow afternoon in through Prince Rupert. I wanna get us to that summer stretch though. Showers tomorrow, a bit of a washout on Thursday, and then as we head into the weekend, here we go. Love it when it lines up like this. Warming for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. A little bit of a concern as we head into early next week. There's a very warm temperatures that uh, some of the long range models are showing in the interior. That will certainly mean the mid 30s. Uh, this will be the start of uh, summer in earnest, Leanne. There, I said it for the first time this season. Summer for real might be just around the corner bringing all that that means. We are as excited for it as Wesley is in the background there, but <laughs> praying for that balmy weather, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a balance. Just a few showers, that's all he wants. Really exactly. hanging off the leg right now. So uh, I've got sun for everyone, okay, Wesley? I love it. I almost want to see, see you tip that camera down, but you know, that's my own indulgence. All right, we'll let you get back to, to momming. Thank you, meteorologist Johanna <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Well, we're heading across the country for this next story. A Halifax choir is holding an outdoor singing session once a week. And as Colleen Jones finds out, they never know who's going to show up. I've conducted quite a few choirs and usually I know who to expect and so planning for this is a little bit tricky but also exciting because you don't know who you're going to get. So you plan in lots of different layers with lots of options and just kind of see how it goes. Apologies, uh, look like, looks like we're having some audio issues with that story there. Uh, hopefully we'll get it back on track for you. Uh, we're going to a quick commercial break now. You have to see it to believe it, and the name is even harder to believe. When we come back, an introduction to joggling. Stay with us. The guitar in this Bachman Turner Overdrive song was the first one Randy Bachman ever bought, a 1957 Gretsch 6120, the Chet Atkins model in Western Orange. Bachman says he and Neil Young spent hours drooling over it in the window of a Winnipeg music store while he worked to save up for it. I babysat, I had a paper route, you know, getting up early in the morning, throwing papers in guys' yards, um, washed cars. Bachman performed some big hits on that guitar, but in 1976, it was stolen from a Holiday Inn hotel room in Toronto. I cried for, literally at night I'd cry. I love this guitar so much. Bachman spent years and a fortune searching for that guitar, buying up hundreds of them. And then, just recently, someone identified it in this video, shot in a Tokyo restaurant Christmas Eve 2019. It was like being hit in the face with a shovel. It's like, bam, oh man, my guitar, I was, I was in tears. His soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Coco, reached out to the musician, Takeshi, who was born the year the guitar was stolen. He offered to make an exchange, the original guitar, for another one built in 1957. There are fewer than 40, but Bachman found one in perfect condition. And they were made basically in the same day or the same week on the same bench and put together at the same time. In a statement, Takeshi said, I'm so honored and proud to be the one who can finally return this stolen guitar to its owner, the rock star, Mr. Bachman, who was searching for it for nearly half a century. And I feel very grateful for this miracle happening in both our lives. Bachman is now planning a trip to Tokyo to take care of some business, make the exchange with Takeshi, and then perform together. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg.
They're the most studied and famous whale family in the world. What's pushing J-Pod to the brink? I'm Gloria Makarenko, host of the new CBC British Columbia original podcast, Killers. Is it too late to save them? In the year 2050, how will BC look? From agriculture to cities, how will climate change change life? Don't miss 2050 Degrees of Change, a CBC Vancouver original podcast, now available. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver at the 15th Annual Surrey Fusion Festival, a celebration of food, music, and culture on July 23rd and 24th at Holland Park. Plus, it's free to attend. Visit surreyfusionfestival.ca for more info. And tune in to On the Coast Wednesdays for The Climate Changers, a new special series about the people who are taking action against climate change. Learn more at cbc.ca slash bc. All right, before we wrap up our show, we always like to have something fun towards the end. Okay, so this one is definitely a fun story. What do you get when you combine jogging and juggling? Well, apparently juggling is what it's called. A man in Prince Edward Island is very good at it, and he's hoping to break a world record this month. You gotta see it to believe it. Take a look. So juggling is the combined sport of running and the activity of juggling. So when you combine running while juggling, that's what we call juggling with an O instead of a U. Uh, I started in 2014, so I started uh, running and juggling around my neighborhood for a couple weeks until I got uh, really hooked into it and I decided to uh, enter into a race. And uh, from that one race, I got even more hooked and then nine years later, I'm. I have one Guinness World Record to my name and I'm about to get a second, hopefully. So I have a Guinness World Record for the half marathon running while juggling. Uh, that was in 2018 in Toronto. I decided to just do something for fun, something for my, men for my mental health and I started juggling. It's not as easy as just running. Obviously you need the, the endurance, so the running technique. And then you also need a technique of juggling because from the first time I tried to juggle and run, uh, it took me three months until I did my first race. My first race, I came fourth overall while juggling. And then this is when I realized, I'm like, maybe I can go somewhere with this. The community sees a person running while juggling, they stop, they pay attention, and then they want to know why. When you run and juggle during a race, you can stop and do a little act. That's awesome. How much One hand You're famous. I'll just go in the center, right here. All right. Ooh. Oh, wow. Look at this. I'm going to be running at 10 kilometers while juggling. Oh, I can't imagine. It gets people to approach you. You're more approachable. You're the fun guy. So the world record attempt I'm going to go for is the 10 kilometer. I'm teaming up with the UPI the cross country team. So they're letting me use the track. So we're going to be doing a 10,000 meter on track and the goal is to break 36 minutes and 27 seconds. If people can see that running can be more than just an exercise, it can be a form of entertainment on the road, it might get more people to try. Guinness World Record, here I come. Okay, that was unbelievable. I think that story buried the lead. That guy was juggling knives. Unbelievable, very cool. A sport I'd be terrible at. I cannot, bad at jogging and even worse at juggling. Good for him. I hope he uh, does get that record. Okay, that does it for us tonight. Thank you for being with us on CBC News Vancouver at 6. We want to remind you, if you're not watching us on CBC Gem, you might want to check it out. That's our free app. And uh, in tonight for our Late Show is Michelle Elliott. I will be back here tomorrow. Have a good one.